Hi again, Facebook. We are hopefully live now. Uh, I will get confirmation from Eli in just a second. Um, but welcome to our second ever live stream um, that we hopefully have some of the technical stuff a little bit more down. Um, although I think we did okay on the last one, on our first one. Video's so, We're good. awesome. So, um, as some of you may know, uh, every year the planetarium hosts an astronomy day. Um, where we have a fun-filled day of planetarium shows, uh, fun talks, activities, some telescope viewing at night if it's clear. And this year, that was supposed to be today. Um, which, unfortunately, because of the situations, uh, we've had to postpone that. We will be having Astronomy Day, but we're going to have to wait until it is safe for us to open back up. Um, but until then, we still wanted to do something for what was supposed to be our astronomy day. And that's why we're doing a longer live stream um, to give you some fun science content. Um, since you can't spend the day with us at the planetarium, we can at least spend some time together on Facebook. Um, so we have what I think is gonna be a really great schedule for the day. Um, and I have my lovely students here with me again. Um, so we'll go around and do introductions. Um, so, I'm Jessica, I'm the director, so I have the amazing job of running the planetarium. It's awesome, I love it, best job ever. Uh, let's go, Lindsay. I'm, um, I'm a physics graduate student. Eli, I'm a physics undergraduate student. Hey everyone, my name is Josh. I use he, him pronouns, and I am a graduate student in the Masters of Professional Studies um, in Creativity and um, Multidisciplinary Research. Long name, long description, but it's it's fun. But we'll talk about that another time. Thanks for joining <laughs> us. Yeah, so um, throughout this entire live stream, um, Feel free if you have any questions to type them into the comments. Um, Eli is going to be checking that throughout our stream and letting us know what questions you have. Um, just do be aware that there is a bit of a lag between um, what we're doing and when it comes across to you on Facebook. Um, so when you ask a question, it may be a couple minutes before you hear us answer it or get to it. Um, and if we don't right away, we are for the last half hour, starting at 2.30, going to be doing another segment of Ask an Astronomer. And that's where we will try and get to all of the questions that have been asked that we haven't been able to get to so far. All right, so to kick things off, uh, Lindsay is going to do one of our favorite shows um, that has recently, that we've recently, well, I guess it's been a year now. Because you did it the first time Astronomy Day last year. Um, yep. So Lindsay is going to do the history of space flight and telling us all about these amazing women who helped launch us into space and helped us to explore the cosmos. So I'm going to let Lindsay take it over. All right, so first we're gonna talk about some rocket girls that were at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, also, as Jessica said, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave it in the comments um, and I will try to answer any questions um, at the end of this show. Um, and my goal for this show is to introduce you to as many women as possible. And so I'm gonna be talking about a lot of different women, but not going super into depth about any one of them. So when the Jet Propulsion Laboratory started, um, you may know it better as JPL. Um, it's now a part of NASA, but it wasn't a part of NASA when it first started. Um, it first started way back in the 1930s and um, it was working on rockets and it ended up 
applying that to weapons. And so they were making guided missiles and things like that. All these women in this photo um, were the human computers. And so they were doing calculations for trajectories and fuel amounts and things like that, all with paper and pencil. Uh, this picture is from 1953. Um, most of these women did not have college degrees um, in general. Uh, there weren't a whole lot of women going to college for math in the first place. Um, but also they didn't make that a requirement because so many women didn't have degrees, but they wanted women to be able to work at JPL still. Okay, so eventually um, the United States decided that it wanted to go up into space. Um, the woman in this photo is Sylvia Lundy and I'll talk more about her in a little bit. So there were two competing ideas about how to get the US up into space. One was the Jupiter C rocket and that was um, by the United States Navy. And then JPL proposed their Vanguard project. Since JPL had this history of making missiles and weapons, um, the US government decided to go with the Navy's um, idea for the Jupiter C rocket. Well, the Jupiter C rocket got built and uh, ended up exploding on takeoff. Uh, luckily, JPL had been working on the Vanguard rocket kind of in secret, and so they had that a Vanguard rocket ready to go when the Jupiter C didn't work out and they were able to go. Um, it was the first rocket up in space and it also launched a satellite into space. So Macy Roberts, she was the uh, supervisor of the human computers. Um, part of the reason that she kept it um, all women uh, was that she was afraid if she hired any men, they would not take her seriously as a supervisor. Um, she was also um, really looking for um, the team of human computers to work as a team and be collaborative. And so if any, um, anybody was hired and they didn't really fit into that family and the team, um, then they were uh, replaced. So Barbara Paulson, um, in this picture, she is getting her 10 year pin. Um, she worked at JPL for 45 years. Um, she worked on um, the Apollo projects and the Mariner probes um, that went to Venus and Mercury. And she also worked on the Viking and um, the Explorer one. Janez Lawson, she was the first woman and the first black person to get an engineering degree at the college that she was at. Um, she saw an ad for the human computers at JPL and noticed that you did not need to have a degree to be a human computer at JPL. And so she knew that women could probably apply. And so she went to um, be a human computer at JPL and um, she was never allowed to actually be an official engineer. Sylvia Lundy, she um, helped uh, plan out the Voyager missions. And so uh, the Voyager spacecraft launched in the 70s. And as you can see, Voyager 1 uh, visited Jupiter and Saturn and then went off into space. And then Voyager 2 visited Jupiter, Saturn, and then went on to Uranus and Neptune. So at each planet, uh, for instance, when the spacecraft would get to Jupiter, um, Jupiter's uh, gravitational force on the spacecraft um, can alter the trajectory of the spacecraft. And so Sylvia Lundy was 
part of a group that helped calculate exactly how far away from Jupiter and how fast the spacecraft needed to be as it approached Jupiter so that it could get on the right trajectory onto Saturn. And then again at Saturn, calculated exactly um, how far away from Saturn that the um, spacecraft needed to be in order to send the spacecraft on to Uranus and then finally Neptune. And so she figured out this entire um, trajectory pass, uh, paths for the Voyager spacecraft. Sue Finley, um, she actually has been working at JPL for 60 years. She's still working there. Um, she started with uh, the Mariner probes that went to Mars, Venus, and Mercury. Um, her favorite mission that she worked on was Venera, which went to Venus. Um, and the spacecraft in this picture here is the recent Juno mission that is now orbiting around Jupiter. And she worked on that also. So the Mercury 13 um, were a group of women that wanted to become astronauts during the time of the um, Apollo era. Um, they ended up not being able to do that. Um, and this is a video of kind of showing us some of the tests and things that they went through. While the Americans were recruiting astronauts, the All Soviets the continued to rack up firsts in space. In 1963, they launched Valentina, the first female cosmonaut. She flew 48 orbits. That's Jessica. You're good. All the Americans were recruiting astronauts. The Soviets continued to rack up firsts in space. In 1963, they launched Valentina At the Lovelace Clinic in New Mexico, their first female a top secret program was underway to 48 orbits. Lindsay, will you pause yours? Recruit a core of female astronauts. They were dubbed the Mercury 13. Well, they did extraordinarily well in the tests, and they surpassed the men in some ways. And uh, that was a function of their uh, different body type. And they wound up with uh, 20 or so ladies that were all suitable candidates. And of those uh, 20 or 24 that took the tests, 13 were found to be adequate and appropriate candidates for the space program didn't happen because they were 20 years ahead of their time. The program never received any kind of encouragement from NASA. In fact, uh, active steps were taken to quash it. And so the ladies, ladies who had been given tremendous stimulation and they were all very excited about being astronauts and everybody at Lovelace thought they were going to be astronauts were suddenly told that they couldn't be. Jerry Cobb and her team just were ready and eager to fly capture, when the program um, like was suddenly halted. The video so the no video explanation was ever given to them, although the orders apparently came from the highest level. I've seen a copy of a memo from Vice President Lyndon Johnson in which he uh, was requiring uh, James Webb to look into the suitability of women as candidates for space and in All the Lyndon Johnson's handwriting the across the bottom, the well, instead of a signature, rack up first in was space. the phrase, in let's put a stop to this now. Valentina and that apparently was cosmonaut. Lindsay, I got it blank. The death knell of the Mercury 13's aspirations to go into space. Most of them never knew about this till years later, but and they never gave up to this day. They. Uh, still are looking for a ride. They want to go in space. There's no difference in capability of, of pilots, whether women or men. But the problem was there were no women with experience in research and development. So you pick the guys with experience in research and development, and that, that's just a smart way of doing it. 
Valentina Tereshkova would be the last woman in space until Sally Ride boarded an American space shuttle two decades later. By the end of 1963, the total number of astronauts had risen to 30. They'd all be vying for the 20 available seats on Gemini. All right, back over to you, Lindsay. So next we are going to check out some hidden figures that were at NASA during the Apollo era. So first we have Dorothy Vaughn, Katherine Johnson, and Mary Jackson. And if you have seen the movie Hidden Figures, you will recognize those names uh, from that movie. Um, Dorothy Vaughn, she was the first acting supervisor of the West Area Computers, which was the human computer group at NASA. Um, and eventually when the um, machine computers started to arrive at NASA, she knew that the human computers um, would not be needed eventually. And so she taught herself how to use the new machine computers and eventually became the expert on those computers um, at NASA and taught all of her human computers um, how to use these new machine computers. Uh, Katherine Johnson, um, she helped calculate trajectories um, for Project Mercury and also um, the Apollo missions. Um, and when they first got those machine computers um, to help calculate trajectories for the Apollo missions, um, Katherine Johnson was actually asked to check the calculations of the machine <laughs> computers because um, she was such a great mathematician. Um, she also now has a building named after her um, at one of the NASA sites. Mary Jackson, she was NASA's first black female engineer. She ended up actually getting to the highest possible level for an engineer. And eventually though, she decided to give that up and become um, a member of the Office of Equal Opportunity Programs at NASA to help get more um, women and minorities interested in STEM. And all three of these women uh, received the Congressional Medal of Honor. Here is Katherine Johnson um, in front of her new building that was named after her. And um, there she is getting her medal from President Obama. Uh, next we have Margaret Hamilton. Um, she was a computer scientist and she helped uh, make code for the onboard computers for the Apollo missions. And her code actually helped them land on the moon. Um, and it's a really cute story involving her daughter. And so I'm gonna have her um, tell you all about it. All right, let's switch over to the video. They announced that they were looking for people to do programming to send man to the moon. And I just thought, wow, <laughs> I've got to go there. <laughs> I grew up in the Midwest, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, Upper Peninsula. I just enjoyed school, but there was something about math that I just liked more than everything else. I liked deriving the answers because I didn't want to memorize. It was too much. I was lazy. <laughs> husband was in law school. They wanted the law wives, my being one of them, to pour tea. And I said to my husband, no way am I pouring tea as a Harvard law wife. If I go to Harvard law school, fine, I'll do what the men do, but I'm not going to be put in that position. And he was very proud of me that I had taken that stand. announced that they were looking for people 
to do programming to send man to the moon. I was the first programmer they hired. I came up with the term software engineering, and it was considered a joke. What? Software is engineering? <laughs> men were working there and they had somebody at home to take care of their kids. I had no choice. I bring my daughter Lauren into work nights and weekends and she'd see me playing astronaut to test the software and doing the kinds of things the astronaut would do. So she wanted to do it too so she played astronaut and all of a sudden everything came crashing on the simulator and I realized that what she had done is that she selected the pre-launch program during flight. I said, oh my God, this is not good. We really need to put a protection in there because the astronaut really could do what she did by mistake. I tried to get it through MIT, NASA. No, they said, astronauts are trained never to make a mistake. was an emergency. Everything happened that we thought would happen if they made the mistake. So then there was a decision, go, no, go, land or don't land. Fortunately, the people at Mission Control trusted our software and they said, go, go, go. The software and the hardware worked perfectly. The software was on the ground <laughs> and on the moon. That's one small step for man, one Her example speaks of the American spirit of discovery that exists in every little girl and little boy who know that somehow to look beyond the heavens is to look deep within ourselves. Being fearless, even when the experts say, no, it doesn't make sense, they didn't believe it. Nobody did. It was something that we were dreaming of happening, but it became real. <laughs> Back over to Lindsay after probably one of my favorite videos. Yeah, I love that video. All right, so next we have Joanne Morgan. Um, she was the only woman in um, mission control during Apollo 11, um, the first moon landing. Um, she actually started out as an engineer's aide at the Army Ballistic Missile Agency and NASA wasn't actually created yet at that point. Um, and she was so good at her job there working with the rockets um, that she was hired at NASA to help with the Apollo missions. Um, and this was actually before she even had her engineering degree. <laughs> so she was already super impressive. Um, and then she was the instrumentation controller for Apollo 11. Um, and she did have to deal with some um, male co-workers um, saying crude things to her and telling her she didn't belong in mission control. And she actually wasn't even allowed in the mission control room until the day of the launch. Uh, Poppy Northcutt. She was uh, the first woman to serve as an engineer in the Apollo program. She was in mission control during Apollo 8. So a little bit before jo Joanne Morgan. Um, she made calculations for the um, path of the Apollo 8 um, to bring the Apollo 8 astronauts back home. 
She also worked on the Apollo 13. Um, so if you haven't heard of Apollo 13, um, they had um, issues during their launch and they ended up not being able to land on the moon. And so they needed new trajectories um, to help them get back to earth safely. So she was one of the women that helped with all of those trajectory calculations. Ethel Heineke Bauer, um, she also helped calculate trajectories for various um, Apollo missions and also helped with the calculations for the trajectory for the Apollo 13 mission. Uh, Margaret Brennecke was a metallurgist. She was the first female welding engineer um, at NASA. Um, she was an expert welder and she was in charge of making critical decisions about materials that were used to build the various components of the Saturn V rocket, which launched the Apollo moon missions. Uh, Barbara Crawford Johnson, um, I'm not sure why that top was cut off. Um, she was an aeronautical engineer. Um, she was tasked with the calculating the trajectory to get the Apollo astronauts from the moon back to Earth. And she also developed the entry monitor system. Billy Robertson, um, she helped create the first computer models for launches and wrote manuals on how to use them. Judy Sullivan, um, she was a um, biomedical engineer um, and she built the, biomed or built the biomedical system. So all of the astronauts' spacesuits had sensors in them um, to send um, medical data about themselves to um, mission control. And so she helped um, watch for that data and make sure all of the astronauts were doing well. So the first female in space, um, you saw in the Mercury 13 video, it was Valentina Tereshkova. Um, she went up into space on June 16th, 1963. Um, to this day, she still holds the record for being the youngest woman in space at age 26. And she is still the only woman to make a solo space flight. Uh, Svetlana Savitskaya, she went up into space on July 19th, 1982. She was the first woman on a space station and the first woman to do a spacewalk and the first woman to do more than one space flight. So she did two. So now for some American female astronaut achievements, we put our first woman into space, June 18th, 1983. Um, that was Sally Ride. Catherine D. Sullivan. Um, she was the first American woman to perform a spacewalk in 1984. Shannon Lucid was the first Chinese born woman in space and the first woman to do at least three space flights. Millie Hughes Fulford in 1991, she was the first female payload specialist. Eileen Collins in 1999, she was the first female space shuttle commander. Peggy Whitson, she was, uh, she holds the record for oldest female spacewalker at age 47. So she was still in space at age 47. Um, and as of April 24th, 2017, she had spent the longest cumulative amount of time spent in space by any astronaut, 665 days. So even more than any of the male astronauts. And she is in eighth place for how much time she has spent in space total amongst all her missions, um, and that's among all the astronauts. Uh, Christina Cook, um, she has the record now for the longest time for a woman in space. Um, she was in space from March 14th, 2019 through February 6th, 2020, and that was 328 days of uh, continuously being in space. Uh, Christina Cook also participated in the first all-female spacewalk um, with Jessica Muir. Seeing Jessica Muir, 
Let's make uh, not her first steps, but her first float out of the uh, out of the hatch there. Congratulations, Christina and Jessica, on this historic event. What you do is is really something very special. So first the moon, and then we go to Mars. For us, it's just coming out here and doing our job today. We were the we were the crew that was tasked with this assignment. At the same time, we recognize that it is a historic achievement, and we do, of course, want to give credit to all of those that came before us. There have been a long line of female scientists, explorers, engineers, and astronauts. We have followed in their footsteps to get us where we are today. Go women! And it just so happens that we have the right people doing the right job at the right time. And in fact, this is historic because those two right people are women. It's been 100 years that we've had the right to vote this year. So this year, while we celebrate that, we also check another box, women doing spacewalk. And the next one, the big one, is for us to walk on the moon. This is a milestone. It symbolizes exploration by all that dare to dream and work hard to achieve that dream. We hope an inspiration to all future explorers. All right, Lindsay, back to you. Oh, you're muted. So lastly, we have this last class of astronauts, the most recent um, group of astronauts, and they are for the Artemis mission um, that is going to the moon, maybe as soon as 2024. Um, in the back row is Kayla Barron. Um, the middle row, left to right, um, Jennifer Seide Gibbons, Jasmine Mogbelli, Jessica Watkins. And in the front row, um, from left to right, Zena Cardman and Laurel O'Hara. Um, so they're make, trying to make sure that these new missions are more diverse than previous missions. Um, and then if you want to learn more about some of these women, um, Rise of the Rocket Girls is all about the women at JPL. Um, Galaxy Girls has 50 amazing stories of women in space. And then there are a couple books about the Mercury 13 also. Uh, Eli, did we get any um, questions submitted? Uh, I'm not seeing any right now. Nope. All right. Well, we'll give it a minute and see if we get any questions. And remember, if you do have any questions, you can type them into the comment box. Um, and Eli is checking that for us to let us know when questions do come in. Um, now, I know, Lindsay, when we first thought about this show, it was initially just supposed to be kind of women in astronomy. But then yes. as you were researching it, you realized that there were a lot. <laughs> do you want to talk about that a little bit? So, yeah, this started as kind of a history of astronomy in general, but then I found so many females in history um, that were astronomers um, and didn't really get credit for that. And then also so many women involved in the space flight and Apollo programs um, that, you know, I had never even heard of. And I think almost every time I do the show, I actually find a new woman to add um, to the show. And so, yeah. Yeah, and so this is a new um, show series that we have started doing um, on Wednesdays during our free programming at the planetarium. Um, and so right now it's been just the history of space flight.
but um, we're going to start adding to that and adding um, other history of other branches of STEM and astronomy as well, um, which I'm excited for because there's there's a lot. There's a lot of cool women out there who unfortunately don't get the credit they deserve. All right, Eli, how are we looking? Um, no questions still. All right. Well, if you do end up coming up with a question, just type it below like we said, um, or type it in the comments and we will eventually get to it. Um, our last segment for today is going to be that Ask an Astronomer, where we will get to all of the questions that we haven't been able to get to. Um, and you know what? It could also be your chance to maybe try and stump us. See uh, if you can ask us something we don't know, which would be cool, because I like that, because then I get to go and learn something new by researching whatever I got asked that uh, I know about. All right. Well, thank you, Lindsay, for the awesome show. I never get tired of that one, especially the Mar Margaret Hamilton video. It just, it gets me every time. Um, so for the next part, we're going to do a little at-home demo. Um, this is a little bit of astronomy that you can do for yourself at home that is not going to take much specialized equipment. And it's not going to be, oops, it's not going to be um, that difficult to make. So in the description for the live stream, I have put links to two of the um, posts that I have referenced uh, as far as making these things. Um, so you will have those, but I guess I should tell you what we're doing. So we're going to be making a pinhole projector. And what this does is allows us to look at the sun safely without hurting our eyes. So a lot of times when people think astronomy, they think nighttime. And for the most part, that is true. But there is astronomy that you can do during the day because the sun is in space. It is a part of astronomy. We can learn about the sun. And there are a lot of reasons we may want to do that. Um, one good reason is the sun is our closest star. And so that means it's going to be the easiest star for us to study because it's, it's right there. It's right next door to us. But then our sun also gives us all of our light and heat, and it's important for us to know kind of what's going on there because that could have an effect on us. Um, so the problem, though, is because the sun is so close, it is incredibly bright, so bright that you should not ever look at it directly. Um, it will just, it'll damage your eyes. You don't want to do it. Um, you sp especially don't want to look at the sun through a telescope or a pair of binoculars because that just makes it even worse. But there are a couple of special ways that you can look at the sun safely. Um, and the kind of key to this is being able to block most of the sun's light from getting to your eyes and just letting in a teeny tiny little bit and that can allow you to do this safely. Um, and so one way that you can do it, um, and this is something that you may have heard about or seen around a couple years ago when we had the solar eclipse that came through the United States, and that's using a pair of cell, um, eclipse glasses. Now, these are not the same thing as just sunglasses. Sunglasses do block some sunlight because, you know, that's their purpose, but they don't block enough for it to be safe for you to look directly. These solar glasses block over 99% of the sun's light, making it safe. But you have to buy those. You have to find them and buy them, and so it's not always a practical way. And so another way that you can do this is by building a pinhole projector. And it's really, really simple. So all you need for this is a piece of cardboard, some scissors, some tape, um, a push pin, if you can see that, and a sheet of white paper. And this is going to get you a very, very, very simple penhole projector. 
when all you gotta do is get um, your piece of cardboard. And this doesn't have to be specifically cardboard, it can be cardstock, any sort of rigid up, uh, thing that's going to hold its shape when you hold it up, but you can poke a hole through. And then all you gotta do is take your push pin, poke a hole through it to create a tiny little pinhole. And it's that simple where you then can go find the sun and with your back to it, hold up your pinhole and then your piece of paper in front. Oops, let me see, there we go. And your picture of the sun is gonna show up on the piece of paper. Now this is the very, very simple way of doing it. Um, and essentially what's happening is your tiny little pinhole, which I know you can't actually see on my camera, um, is doing what we need it to do. That is blocking most of the light coming from the sun and just letting a teeny tiny little bit come through. And that's allowing us to create an image of the sun that is dim enough for us to safely look directly at it. Um, so this is the simplest way, but there are ways to improve your image. Um, what you want is for your pinhole to be as small as possible and as kind of clean, as sharp of edges as possible, as possible. So another way of doing that, instead of just poking directly through your piece of cardboard, is you want to actually cut a square out of your cardboard and with one more piece of equipment that I didn't mention, take a little piece of tin foil and tape it over that square that you cut up that you cut out and then poke your pinhole through that. That's going to allow you to create a very tiny, very um, sharp edged uh, pinhole, which is going to give you a much clearer, sharper image of the sun. Now, while this is a very easy, simple way, there are some drawbacks to the very simple, just pin and then some sheet of paper to project onto. And that's making sure that you can get everything lined up. If this is tilted, your image is gonna be all weirdly wonky shaped. It's not gonna be quite right. And so this can be a little finicky when doing it, um, when actually using it. So another way is to build the same thing, but with a box version. And so you want to get a box, um, whatever empty cardboard box you would like. And then we're gonna do kind of the same thing. You're going to cut a square out of the box. And then over that square, you will then tape, trying to do this with two hands, I need more. You're gonna tape that piece of tin foil and then poke a hole in that tin foil to make your pinhole. And then on the other side of the box, on the opposite side from where your pinhole is, you're going to tape in a piece of white paper. Now this step isn't crucial um, this just makes it a lot easier for you to see your picture of the sun, but you don't have to have it. And so that's going to give you, while I move around, um, this box version, where again, you have that pinhole, and then you're viewing on the opposite side. And you'd use it in a similar way as the other one. You'd go to where you can see the sun, with your back to the sun, you'll hold up your box so that the pinhole is facing the sun. And then you'll look at where your white sheet is, where your image is going to be of the sun. Um, now, as you can see in this one, I've actually taped the rest of the box closed. And it's because the darker you have it inside, the easier it is to see your picture of the sun, although it's not necessary to do that. Um, so yeah, that is another way. And then of course the kind of fun thing about this is you can decorate your pinhole projector box with whatever you'd like. So when you do this, you will end up getting 
images that look kind of like this. So on the left is a picture of the sun seen through my box pinhole projector. You can see the nice crisp picture of the sun there. And then on the right is the one using that really simple just piece of cardboard and a sheet of paper. Um, one thing you'll notice is with the simple one, the image is bigger. And that's because you're able to control how far apart your pinhole is from the paper. The further apart they are, the bigger your image of the sun is going to be. But as you can also see, there's a caveat to that. The bigger your picture of the sun is, the dimmer it looks. And so there's some give and take there. Um, but that is kind of what you would see. Now today, unfortunately, our sun is a little boring. Um, but on other days, there are some features that you could see on the sun using this method. Um, so this is a picture of the sun. Uh, and you can see that the sun has these kind of dark spots on it. These are what we call sunspots because they're spots on the sun. We are not always super clever when we come up with names. Um, but if these sunspots are big enough, you can see them in your image of the sun with your pinhole projector. And so this can be a cool way for you to kind of study the sun and see the features for yourself without having to have any really fancy equipment. Um, if you're able to see these sunspots over a couple of days, you can also watch as they move across the sun because the sun does spin. It rotates. And so you can watch that as it happens. Now, there are a lot of other really cool features on the sun that, unfortunately, we cannot see with the simple pinhole projector. Um, you may see a lot of pictures of the sun with these big loops of gas coming off the sides. Um, those are what we call prominences, or just loop, because it's simpler. Um, those tend to be very faint. And so you have to have a telescope, a special solar telescope, not just any normal telescope, um, a special one to be able to do that. Um, now, if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about what's going on on the sun today, um, you can always head over to spaceweather.com which is going to have an image of the sun of that day and show you if there are any sunspots or things going on. Um, and so this is a way for you to maybe kind of check ahead of time if you can expect to see any, or if you think you see something, you can go and check the website and see if you're right. Um, now you will see on here that we do have a tiny little sunspot on the sun today. Um, but that one is just too small for us to be able to see. We need kind of a bit bigger. And they can get much, much bigger. Um, now, one of the reasons that we may be interested in knowing this sort of thing is because these sunspots tend to happen along with other types of activity. When we see lots of sunspots, we also see lots of those loops, lots of prominences. And what can happen with a loop, um, since it's just this loop of gas, it can continue to move off and kind of stretch. Well, sometimes it'll stretch too far that the loop snaps, just like if you were to stretch a rubber band too far. And when it snaps, it flings all of that gas out into space in what we call a solar flare. And solar flares in themselves aren't dangerous, but when we have a big enough one pointed at us, we can experience um, static on the radios. Um, we can see disruptions in like cell phone communications or GPS. And so it is something that we are interested in kind of knowing. And while we can't predict when exactly a flare is going to happen. We do know since they are kind of linked to the appearance of sunspots, when we see a lot of sunspots, we have a higher chance of a flare happening and a higher chance of having those sort of disruptions. 
Um, so yeah, that's a fun way that you can do that. Like I said, I have linked to um, a couple of different uh, posts that um, I've used to reference um, that have instructions on how to do this. They also have some different projects that you could use this for. Um, one of them, as I said, is you know seeing sunspots, but also seeing how they move, um, which can help uh, if you want to figure out how quickly the sun spins, you can use that. Um, you can also use the size of the sun in your image to calculate how big the sun actually is. There's a lot of cool things that you can do with this um, and a lot of more kind of in-depth projects you can do with this as well. Um, so that went by a little bit faster than I had planned. So <laughs> Eli, do we have any questions coming up? Um, yeah, we did get one question, but it um, pertained more to um, the history of STEM. So I'm wondering if we want to save that for the end during Ask an Astronomer, or if we want to tackle that now. I'd say go ahead. We have some time. Um, like I said, I ran a little bit short with this. Um, so yeah, if Lindsay. Um, yeah, so the question comes from Polly Oaks and Chapik. I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Um, how come Ron Howard uh, didn't have a woman in his Apollo 13 movie helping to save their lives? Um, I would say that maybe we didn't know about all of these women at that time. Um, a lot of these women who contributed to space flight and astronomy, their names have been lost. And it was the men that took the credit for a lot of this stuff. Um, and so he may not have known about all these women um, that worked behind the scenes. And I think um, a lot of, um, we didn't even know about, you know, Katherine Johnson and Dorothy Vaughn and Mary Jackson um, until the book Hidden Figures came out. Um, and the only way I would have known about all the women that worked at JPL is through reading that book by, um, Natalia Holt. So I think we just didn't know that they actually were there at NASA during that time. Um, awesome. Uh, we don't have any other questions right now. So. All right. Well, um, I guess we can go ahead a little bit. I know Stellarium is going to take a minute or so for me to load up. So let's do that real quick. Um, I'm gonna put over on the title screen just for a second until I can get Stellarium up and loaded. And we will move on to our next segment, which is what's up tonight. And so for this program, we're going to be using a really cool software known as Stellarium. This is basically a um, free planetarium software that you can download for free and you can simulate the sky for any place on Earth for any date and any time. And so while we can't do this in the actual dome of the planetarium right now, since we are closed, we can still give you a tour of the night sky and uh, give you some cool things to kind of look for when we have some clear nights and you can kind of go out and see them for yourself. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Josh, who is gonna lead us through uh, what's up tonight. And you are muted. OK, there you go. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, hello, everyone. Once again, Josh coming to you live um, from Ironton, Minnesota, um, in my new um, home office, which uh, is my bedroom right now. And um, yeah, like Jessica was saying, Stellarium is this awesome free software that you can use as far as you are, um, as far as maybe planning a night sky viewing, or you just kind of want to see what's up for the month of April, um, or you want to see what's up for any certain time, you know, see when Halley's Comet's coming back around or something of that matter. 
Um, so, um, well, let's kick it off. Um, hello. Um, and where we're going to begin this um, what's up tonight, um, plus what's up for April, a little bonus thrown in there for everyone joining us this afternoon. Um, we are going to start off in the Western sky at 8.30 p.m. Um, Central Time or 20.30, 24 time and or 24 hour time, 24 time. I don't know if that's, a, maybe that's a jazz thing. We can ask you about that later. Um, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna start off in the West um, and actually let's wind back our clocks to um, 7.30 p.m. or 19.30 hour earlier. One thing I just want to highlight, and Jessica, go ahead and just jump in if I'm ahead of you or if you need time or if nope. I'm just- You're all good. Off cue, okay, cool. So at 19.30 or 7.30 PM in the Western sky, um, hopefully what you're seeing right now is that the horizon is lit with this orange pink light of the um, low angled rays of our sun entering the atmosphere. And you get that reddish, that orange, um, and not that um, wonderful sky blue that you get when you get more direct sunlight um, moving through less atmosphere. But if we just raise our gaze um, a little bit above the horizon, we find Venus. Um, and actually I've tested this myself um, to maintain some sanity during our time in quarantine. I have gotten outside, woohoo. And I was astounded um, when I went out at around this time when the sun had just dipped below the horizon, the sky is still bright with the afterglow of the sun. Uh, and you could see the moon. Um, this was a couple days ago. And the other thing that I saw, which I had to kind of do a double take was the evening star um, as it's sometimes called, but it is the planet Venus. And it, you can see it during these kind of twilight periods where the majority of the sky, um, besides the moon, is um, still well lit with the sun. You can see the planet Venus. Um, and the reason for that is because the planet Venus is so close to us, off in the western sky as it's setting with the sun um, and it's reflecting the sun's light. So you can actually kind of see it. It's, it's harder to find um, during the daytime. You almost have to like stare uh, off into space, pun intended for a little bit and kind of just focus in. And right now um, the moon um, will be up, um, will be up during twilight, but it is more off towards the Eastern Southeastern sky. We'll get to that. We don't have to go there right now. Um, and so in our new time in quarantine, um, Venus also um, <laughs> is a highlight, um, especially for this video experience, because it has also everything to do with lag. Um, everything you're going to see from the Earth that you were standing on, actually there is some delay. Um, for the moon, it's about one light second. So when you look at the moon, when we get there, the light you'd be seeing if you were outside actually would be what the moon looked like a second ago, one second in the past. Venus, on the other hand, um, I believe I was able to find that at its nearest distance, which is 43 million kilometers or somewhere around 27 million miles, it takes two minutes and 20 seconds for the light of Venus to be reflected off of its, off of its atmosphere off of its cloud layers and then um, shown into our eyes. So you're kind of seeing Venus at two minutes and 20 seconds in the past when it's at its nearest um, position. So uh, we were kind of testing this video, the video feed out yesterday and it was about a two minute lag. Maybe it's not so much like that today. Maybe, maybe it's more like moon lag and it's only one second behind. Um, but Venus is two minutes and 20 seconds into the past. And so let's go ahead and move time into the future um, to 8.30 p.m. or 20.30, 
24 hour time. Oops, not quite there yet. There we go. All right. So how are we looking, Jessica? We are all set. Perfect. In the West and we all can see stars or at least Jessica, we can see stars. Yep, sure can. Awesome. Perfect. Um, so really quick uh, before we move on, um, Polly Oaks and Chappick asked, uh, my daughter Noelle wants to know if our sky and cottage grove will be the same as yours. And the answer is yes. It's only off by about one degree. So for all intents and purposes, it will be the same sky. Perfect. Thank you for that, Eli. Awesome. So yeah, definitely Cottage Grove, you will be able to see the same thing. Um, those stars that are closer to the horizon right now around what we're seeing as 8.30 p.m. or 20.30, 24 hour time, um, those might be a little different since they're so close to the horizon, they may be different for us. But for all intents and purposes, we're still looking west, looking at Venus. And actually, if we could right now, let's zoom in a little bit. Um, and if we can, you'll see that where Venus is located is actually right next to a star cluster um, that is referred to by many names. Um, you may be familiar with the name Pleiades, Seven Sisters. Um, maybe it is, um, uh, oh, let's see, what can I remember other names? Um, Matariki is one name. Um, the people of, of uh, the Maori of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, that is the, the name for that place in the sky, those constellations. Um, and Venus is actually in it right now. It was actually yesterday that Venus was in the constellation itself. I was unable to witness it because the clouds and the rain, um, but today is actually looking a lot brighter and it's still fairly close to it. And so from that, let's just go to the uh, towards Southwest just a little bit. We're going to visit um, a group of stars called the Hyades Cluster, which is home to the star Aldebaran, at least from our point of view. And that is just a little bit to the left. And so we're still kind of more in the western sky a little bit more into the southwestern sky and so what we've done moving from venus to aldebaran um, is we've actually entered into the um, winter hexagon which you are only going to now see during the evening uh, hours um, as we are now fully into spring mode and so the aldebaran is one of the stars that is part of what it, it may be commonly called um, the winter hexagon. And so I right now, you can go ahead um, and I have on my um, star names, and I think maybe they're already on. Um, and I have the, the, I have Aldebaran and then just above Aldebaran, we can now focus in a little bit more on the winter hexagon, which is more towards the Southwest. Um, here at 8.30 p.m. And we have um, Aldebaran. And then if we jump above Aldebaran, we have Capella. And then to the left of Capella is Pollux. Um, and actually, um, Pollux has a, a twin. Um, and that is Castor. Um, and for the Greco-Roman constellation, that is Gemini. And having said that, let's go ahead and turn on our constellation lines and um, connect some dots. Uh, um, great thing about being an astronomer is that you get to connect dots from third grade on to being a 24 year old. So the fun never ends. So Castor and Pollux are the Gemini twins. And then if we kind of go um, down and to the left, we have Procyon, which is a star that is a part of the Canis Minor constellation. It is a single line. so. Canis Minor is a small dog. So whatever favorite small dog of yours fits in that spot, it is yours to imagine. And if we drop down from Procyon, we find the brightest star in the night sky, which is Sirius. So for those of you that are gonna go out during twilight tonight to look, see if you can find Venus. 
Um, if you stay out even later and just wait for it to get a little bit darker, um, the next star that you will be able to see, or I'm sorry, the next bright object that you'll be able to see in the night sky will be Sirius. Um, first will be Venus and the moon, of course. The moon kind of takes all when it's up in the sky. And then you'll see, you'll see the moon, you'll see Venus, and you'll also get to see Sirius. And then if we go to the left of Sirius, we have Rigel. And, um, oh, let's go back to Sirius. Sirius is part of the constellation Canis Major. And Canis Major is the major dog, the big dog. Um, and then to the right of Sirius, we have the blue bright star Rigel, which is part of the Greco-Roman constellation Orion, Orion the hunter. And so that is kind of a quick overview of the winter hexagon, which is due to its name, no longer going to be present with us later on. And so um, with that, let's actually migrate a little bit. We'll stay the same time, but we're going to migrate over to the moon. So for those of you that were going to be star hopping tonight, um, we went from Venus to Aldebaran, which is part of the winter hexagon. And then if you want to wander your way over to where the twins, the Gemini twins are hanging out, Castor and Pollux. Um, they're kind of standing right in front of the moon. Um, and if you want to go from the Gemini to uh, Pollux to the constellation Cancer, um, which is Cancer the Crab, it's kind of that double Y um, constellation there, and then from Cancer over to Leo. And in the constellation of Leo tonight, we find the moon. And so one thing I just want to talk about the moon while we're there um, is that uh, what you may find is that while the moon is coming above the, is just, just reaching above the horizon um, as it's rising or as it's just setting, you may find that it, the moon has seemingly grown somehow as if it jumped um, a little bit closer to the earth. Um, but in reality, what's going on is that due to the distance of the horizon when the moon is rising and setting, it looks like our, our, our brain is trying to coordinate um, where is trying to give us a best idea of how far the moon is. And if the moon is right next to the horizon as it's rising or setting, your brain is calculating, your, your biological calculator is calculating um, that the moon is somewhere around the same distance as the horizon line, wherever that is at for you. Um, and if the horizon is pretty far off, you kind of get this feeling that the moon is somehow closer. But what you want to do during these rising or setting times is stick out your arm at full length and give the moon a thumbs up and hold your thumb right next to the moon and just kind of look at the size comparison between your thumb and the moon. And then as the night progresses or you go out at a different night, say tonight when the moon is not near the horizon but is very high up in the sky in the constellation of Leo at 8.30 p.m., um, you will find that the moon, you can stick your thumb up and compare the size of the moon to your thumb. And you'll find that it will be around the same size. Um, but it's almost, it's always more fun to um, trial that out yourself. And then instead of just hearing it from me. Um, and for those of you that want to pay attention, that are paying attention to the phases of the moon, um, the first of April was um, the first quarter. And then the full moon will occur on the night of April the 7th. And then the third quarter um, will be April 14th. So since we've already gone through the first quarter, we have the moon to be um, growing in brightness. And so um, maybe if you zoom in 
on the um, moon here, you might be able to see it. Or if you go out tonight, the other thing you can do is um, if you look, you'll see that the right side of the moon is um, the illuminated side. And it's technically at this point, it is a, um, a waxing gibbous for all of you um, word nerds out there. And when the moon is illuminated on the right, it is getting brighter. Each night you'll find that it gets brighter. And so a fun little way to remember that is if the moon is light on the right, it is growing bright. Light on the right, the moon is growing bright. So a little um I like that. that. I haven't heard that one before. <laughs> I I see I it was one of the things I learned while I was an undergraduate in college. Um and it wasn't in a class. I had a friend who actually told me that and I was like, that's so funny that I've never come across that until now. But I was happy to learn of it. Um so the moon is growing bright um, because the light is on the right or whatever order of those, light, right, bright. And so that is what we'll leave. Um, we'll, we'll depart from the moon and we'll actually, do you see um, the Virginids meteor shower icons, Jessica? Awesome, so I won't hang around these too long. I just would like to point these out. Um, and we're looking now in the east, southeast. We're still around 8.30 p.m. Um, so still not past my bedtime. Mom's not yelling at me quite yet um, to go to bed. But if you, what, what will be difficult for any meteor showers around this time is that the moon is out. And the moon illuminates the night sky. I, I went out actually last night after it cleared a little bit, <laughs> it was super cold, took the dog for a walk. And it was just incredible how much you can see with the moon illuminated even at a, a waxing gibbous at um, growing brighter towards the full moon. Um, I could see everything around me um, and I do not live in a populated area. So there was not a lot of street lights. I avoided setting off the garage light, um, the motion light on the garage. I wanted to see the stars. Um, so the moon illuminates the night sky and the night world very well. And so what's going to be difficult to see then are things such as um, the virginids. Um, and they've got um, these signifiers that uh, the top one would be pi virginids and the bottom one would be theta virginids. So Greek letters um, denoting the different meteor showers. And so the little bright spot with the spikes coming off of it, that's just to kind of show you the, um, the origin point where the meteors are going to be streaking away from. So uh, we've just gotten out of um, the winter season, um, though it's March and May, and I'm sure for those of us in Duluth, you're not holding your breath. There, it, we just got snow in Duluth. I'm in, in towards Crosby, Ironton, Brainerd, a little more southwest. Um, we got rain. I think a couple days back, but I'm, I, I heard Duluth got snow. So um, whenever you're driving through a snowstorm or it's snowing and you're driving, um, that effect of the snow streaking past you while you're on the highway is kind of the same perspective that we hear we have here on Earth. Um, instead of uh, um, an astro minivan, an astro van, um, we have planet Earth. Um, that we're moving in and the outside world is the solar system which the earth is moving through and the snowflakes would then be these debris that could be icy debris rocky debris but it's usually leftover particles from a comet that is arcing or not arcing is orbiting around the sun and so we're just moving through that pathway of the comet and so actually what you're seeing those two points Pi virginids and theta virginids, that is actually the direction now that we can see the Earth is going because it's the Earth moving through a debris path, a debris field that creates the um, meteor showers. So you, when we're looking east, southeast, that's the direction the Earth is going at 8.30 p.m. tonight. And so from there, 
um, and Eli at any time, if there are any like immediate questions that would be better to answer, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, I, yep. I will not be upset, I promise. Yep, I'm watching the chat. We haven't gotten anything through yet, but I'll let you know. Perfect, thank you. Um, and so what we're going to do now is we've talked about Venus. We've talked about the exiting stage left winter hexagon. Um, and we've talked a little about the moon, um, its phases, the, um, sorry, <laughs> and um, the virginids, the meteor showers. And then the next thing we're gonna talk about is something that comes a little later in the night. So uh, early morning, we're gonna go to the AM. So let's go ahead and turn the clocks to 3.30 AM. And since it is after um, 12 o'clock at night, it will also be 3.30, um, 24 time. So what you'll see, and we're, I'm facing east, and if you're oriented east, um, you'll see that the stars are rising. And so east is the direction which the planet is turning. And so you'll continually see new stars um, in that direction. And so once it gets close enough to 3.30, we can stop it. And what you'll see in the east now are constellations that are summer sky constellations. So this is me introducing some warm thoughts into your space, some, um, some um, summertime vibes. Um, we are now getting by looking at 3.30 a.m. So if you're a, a very early riser or quite the night owl, um, facing the eastern sky at 3.30 a.m. or 3.30, 24 time, um, you are seeing night sky constellations. Um, and with the constellations that we have up right now, that would be um, the Greco-Roman constellations. And so what we have here right in front of us kind of right above the eastern direction is the summer triangle. And so in the summer triangle at the top of it is a very bright star called Vega. And Vega is part of an instrument called a lyre. And so the, the, the Greco-Roman constellation is Lyra. It's very near to a harp, just a little bit smaller um, and um, I'm sure you could find it um, used in uh, probably a Romeo and Juliet if you're looking for a movie suggestion for tonight on your Saturday evening. Um, before, of course, you, you, you know, set your alarm clock to wake up at 3.30 to see Lyra in the sky at, at your choice. Um, and so down into the left of Vega in the constellation Lyra is this large sprawling constellation um, and it is called Cygnus and the brightest or the star to note the bright star in this constellation is Deneb and so Cygnus is a swan for the Greco-Roman constellations and it is flying um, kind of from left to, to right across your screen Cygnus the swan is um, and another thing to note is that um, the constellation itself um, is kind of a, it, it goes by different names, it has different images. So for um, our Greco-Roman relatives that live across the pond, um, that was the night sky that they saw. But the night sky that is um, indigenous, that is native to the land that we are on now, at least for all of us that are watching from Minnesota, um, a constellation that you can see there is um, with your um, looking through an Ojibwe perspective, or you can ask your Ojibwe community member, um, is that that is the constellation of a bird, but it is not a swan, it is Ajijak. And um, Ajijak is a um, sandhill crane. And you should be hearing those now, or maybe I'm the only one that lives close enough to um, the, the wet, some wetland areas, but you can hear them um, talking to one another 
um, during the daytime. And as with all the other birds, they are now starting to move north once again to our regions. And so from the star Vega down to the star Deneb, which is the Greco-Roman constellation Cygnus or the Ojibwe constellation Ajijak. If we go down and to the right now to finish our triangle or the, visit the last star in our triangle, we visit the star Altair. And Altair is part of the Greco-Roman constellation Aquila the Eagle. And Aquila the Eagle is a giant bird up in the night sky. And it is currently on the hunt. Um, and this eagle is um, a very, has a very interesting appetite, let's say. Um, and it is after a constellation called Delphinus. And Delphinus is a dolphin. And Delphinus is kind of just down a little bit to the left of Aquila, the eagle, and the star Altair. And so, I've been watching the night sky quite a bit for the 24 years that I've been here um, on this planet. And so far, Delphinus is quite an elusive um, prey for um, Aquila and they've stayed their distance. Maybe they're taking um, the physical distancing um, to heart as well and they're keeping their distance from one another. Who knows? Um, and so with that, there is the summer triangle and what I would like to do is again just run time a little bit more and let me double check um, the time that I would like to run to and let's just go one hour ahead and go to 4 30 a.m. And what we're going to do you'll see that the sky is rising once again in the east so just an hour ahead and what you should be seeing and possibly seeing off to the right of your screen and we're going to move from eastern facing to now the southeast um, and we're going to drop right below Aquila the Eagle and you will see Jupiter, Saturn and Mars. So for those of you that are getting up really early or maybe you're just gonna stay up all night now because you're just so invigorated to see all of the night sky um, and you can see three planets and they are right next to each other and for these group um, of planets they will not be this close to one each other again until like mid 2022 so if you would like to see mars saturn and jupiter right next to each other um, this would be a good time to see it and Let's see, other things I'd like to mention. Um, Mars will be right below Saturn um, tonight. Um, and you can, see plan you can see the planets like this um, for a couple more nights. You don't have to see it tonight, though I cannot promise what the weather is gonna be like every night. Um, um, meteorology is not involved in the degree that I am um, pursuing in school at the moment, so I wouldn't dare try to guess when is when. I will use Wonderground just like everyone else. Um, but what we can do here is if, Jessica, if you could go to the left-hand side of your screen and click on the date and time uh, window and bring that up. What? Yeah, I've actually had that up. Oh, cool, awesome, sweet. Jessica's way on top of it. Um, so what we can do now is if you wanna see now, this is a cool function to see how, um, instead of just running the time um, forward and just seeing how the night sky arcs over us, we can just progress the day itself. Um, and so if we progress the day ahead once to instead of the fifth, it being the sixth, you'll see that Mars got a little bit farther away. Um, and if we go to the seventh, the 8th, the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th. We can see now the moon is catching up to Mars. Um, and we go to the 15th. Um, the moon has now joined Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars. Jupiter and Saturn are very far 
are much farther away than Mars. Um, and so their trip through the night sky um, takes a little bit longer. So those two are actually getting closer to one another and they will be in conjunction um, sometime soon. And I'm forgetting that date, um, but we'll get that to you possibly in another um, live stream. Um, but what you can see is Mars is now moving farther and farther away from um, the planets Saturn and Jupiter. The moon is caught up um, and makes um, many laps around the night sky a lot faster than Mars, Saturn, and Jupiter because it is so much closer. Um, but if we kind of think about the solar system as a whole, right now, the planet Earth is circling around the sun and it's actually catching up to its neighbor, Mars. And it's getting closer and closer and it'll get to a point where um, it will get so close to Mars that it'll be the perfect time to um, send a mission to Mars because there will be the shortest amount of space um, and we can use the fact that Mars and Earth are so close to send um, what we so wish to go to Mars. And for NASA, that would be um, the 2020 mission, the Perseverance rover. So if that's something you would like to look into, or maybe I accidentally already started introducing a topic that someone's going to talk about <laughs> during um, Ask an Astronomer. Um, not sure, we'll find that out. Um, but I think what's even more cool is that today at 4-4-2020, is um, the place where the Earth was, where our fellow planetarian Eli, um, this is the place where the Earth was so long ago when Eli was born. So um, go ahead and leave <laughs> a happy birthday in the comments for Eli. Happy birthday, Eli. I was definitely not going to leave that out of this. Um, you're in here in my notes. I was planning so, on yeah. doing it in a little bit. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. It's a group effort. It always is. Thank you, guys. Um, so, uh, you know, happy birthday or happy revolution day, um, as this is the place in the Earth's revolution where Eli uh, was born. Um, so with that being said, let's see, I have one more thing that I would like to talk about. And let's see, we want to now venture over to the north and um, date and time will keep up. And if we look over to the north, um, what we have on the year 2020, the month is the fourth month, which is April, and then the um, day is the 15th. What we have at also at 4.53 a.m. Um, is the constellation that is just above the horizon in the north is Camel Oparadalus. Camel Oparadalus. I think I need to go a little bit further. Oh, no, there it is. I see it. We're good. Ha, perfect. Um, and so Cam Camel Park Dallas, <laughs> the, the Camel Constellation. Um, and this may be a good time to turn on um, illustrations. Um, it is um, not a camel, but it is illustrated here as a giraffe. And this is another Greco-Roman constellation. And you can see that it is just kind of down and below the constellation or down into the right of the constellation Ursa Major. And it is just below the, the Greco-Roman constellation Ursa Minor and the tail or the North Star as we um, can call it these days. Now, I'm sure everyone is a huge fan of um, Camel Oparadalus. Um, but you're going to even become a greater fan because if we move time forward from the 15th to the 16th, to the 18th, 19th, and we're going to go all the way till, let's see, when is it? Um, ah, we'll start here on the 27th. So are you able to see a C 2019 Y4? Atlas designation. It should be right below um, Camel Oparadalus. I do. I might have to go ahead to like the 28th or 29th. 
that's okay as well. What is this supposed to be? Um, it's supposed to be a comet. And I yeah, do not kind of... see. Um... All right, you talk, and I'm going to go with my settings and find it. Okay. Um, so during the month of, it's going to be a little lower to the horizon. So if you can get anywhere that, um, that you can see more of the horizon, maybe with less of a tree line, um, this will be uh, more easily viewed. But around the end of, well, mid-April mid to end of April, there will be a comet in the northern direction. And it'll be in the constellation zone on um, the Greco constellation of Camel Opar Dallas, Camel Opar Dallas. And this comet in the, this month of April, you'll be able to see it through um, a, a good pair of hunting or a good pair of binoculars, a good pair of hunting binoculars or a good pair of binoculars. Um, and you'll be able to see it. It'll be a bit of a, a grayish blob um, in your viewing, but what you're seeing is a uh, space fair, let's call it, that just like the planets is orbiting around the sun, but its pathway is very, it's much longer and it's much elongated. The orbits of the planets are almost circular, but they're a little egg-shaped, they're ellipsed. And um, compared to that, the, co the comet Atlas is, has a very elongated ellipse. So it's a lot more of a squished egg um, it's almost more like a grain of rice, let's say, that if you outline a grain of rice, that's maybe more comparable to or relative to the pathway of a comet around the sun. Now, in the month of April, binoculars are going to be necessary to view it, or a telescope, of course. Um, you will not be able to see it with the naked eye during the month of April, or so I've been told, but during the May time, um, and now it, the say May eighth or sometime earlier than that, or or around that time, the sun will be starting to rise. You'll be getting sky glow um, at around five a.m. in the morning. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, five a.m. in the morning, and um, looking north. But the comet um, Atlas, you should be able to see with the um, unaided eye during the month of May. So something to mark on your calendar um, for the end of April and the beginning of May. And with that being said, that is the last that I would like to share with all of you. So that's what was up tonight and a little bit into the future. Um, though, if you ever want to see what this, what constellations, what stars um, will be up later in the year or now later on in the year um, in the evening. All you have to do is stay up really late and you can get to see what is up next to see in the evening later on. So were you, were we able to find the... I was not. I don't know why comets aren't showing up for me. Interesting. I know I... Uh, yeah, huh. I don't know, but just remember the constellation Camel Opar Dallas. How about this? We will post um, or share information about it on our Facebook page. Um, that way you can have yeah. a little map of the sky and know where to see it, since for some reason it's not showing up on mine. Yes, well, we will get that to you all soon enough. Cool. Absolutely. And that is all I have to share. I'm like three minutes over my time. Um, are there any questions? I am watching Facebook now. We don't have any questions, but if you guys have anything you want to ask, send them in. We can talk about them either during the Ask an Astronomer or um, kind of truncate some time for Josh to answer questions about the um, what's up tonight. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Well, um, with that being said, um, I will hand the mic back over to Jessica. Thanks to everyone for tuning in <laughs> for what's up tonight. Yeah, that was awesome. And I know 
we wish we could do this in person in our dome, but this still gets us um, a good way of being able to kind of help show you guys some cool things to see that are coming up. Um, and then we will be back doing it in our dome as soon as it's safe for us to open again. Until then, um, just, you know, keep checking up here because we'll be doing our live streams weekly on Wednesdays and Saturdays at 1. So we are entering the final segment for Mini Virtual Astronomy Day. Um, that is going to be our Ask an Astronomer. So if you still have any pressing questions or maybe a question you have that didn't pertain to anything we've talked about so far, but you just really want to know, uh, type it down in the comments. Um, Eli will let us know when those pop up. In the meantime, I know we each have some interesting things that are either currently going on or just something cool that we like to talk about um, that we will kind of talk about until we get some questions in. And since Josh mentioned the Mars 2020 rover, and I know Lindsay was wanting to talk about that, how about we uh, hand it over to Lindsay and let her fill us in on that cool mission? All right. I am going to share my screen with everybody um, so I can show you guys um, the website you can go to to learn stuff about the Mars 2020 rover. Um, and I'm going to talk about a couple of the really cool instruments that you'll be able to see um, here uh, on the website and learn more about. Um, and so the mast cam, uh, this camera right here. Um, it's going to be able to do panoramic and stereoscopic imaging. Um, and it will also be able to determine mineralogy um, of some of the materials on Mars, Mars' surface. Um, MOXIE is really cool. It's right down here. It's actually an experiment that's going to be turning the um, carbon dioxide in Mars's atmosphere into oxygen, uh, which is going to be a really important thing for us to be able to do um, when humans go to Mars. Uh, PIXEL. Um, is another instrument that is going to be um, analyzing the surface of Mars and to see kind of what materials and molecules exist on the surface. Uh, RIMFAX um, right here um, is going to be state of the art um, radar sensor that is going to be looking at the subsurface geology of Mars. Again, just so we can learn a little bit more about it. Um, the more we know about Mars, um, the easier it'll be for us to go and visit there. And then both Sherlock um, and here's Sherlock and also the SuperCam. Um, they are going to be attempting to find organic compounds on Mars. So in science, organic means um, molecules that contain carbon. And we're pretty sure that in order for there to be life, there has to be organic compounds. Um, and so if we find organic compounds um, on Mars, that will um, let, help us fi um, figure out uh, or help us on the pathway to figuring out if there had been life on Mars or not. Um, and then um, this rover is launching in July. Um, you can see we've got 103 days, 17 hours, and 26 minutes um, until it's going to be launching. Um, it's called Perseverance, and it actually is going to be landing um, on Mars on February 18th, 2021, and it's going to be landing um, on the Jazaro crater on Mars. Um, the mission duration is at least one Mars year, but I think that's been the mission duration for pretty much every rover that we've sent to Mars, and usually we get several, like at least five to ten years out of all of our rovers, so that would be pretty cool. Yeah, and the way this guy is going to be landing on Mars is pretty spectacular. Um, if you remember at all when Curiosity landed, which was, oh god, eight years ago now? Close to eight years ago? Um, it landed in a brand new way that uh, hasn't happened or hadn't happened. So before when we would land 
things on Mars. Um, these were tiny little either landers or robots, and the best way for us to land them was to basically drop them onto Mars and surround them in airbags and cushions. And then they'd land, hopefully those cushions would protect whatever was inside until it kind of bounced and came to a stop and then it deflated and out came the robot or rover or whatever. But with Curiosity, that was the first really big rover we sent. This thing is the size of an SUV. And you can't just drop that with some airbags around it and hope for the best. <laughs> so they had to come up with a new way and it, they ended up doing it with a hovering sky crane, where literally it was a hovering platform that Curiosity was attached to that they lowered down and set on the surface of Mars. And then, so um, that was terrifying when it was all happening because it was all automated. Um, we just had to hope that things were going to go right. Um, and that is exactly how Perseverance is going to be landing as well because it's another very large rover. Um, so yeah, that's going to be terrifying and exciting to watch as it happens. Um, and to bring back something that Josh was saying, um, since Mars is even further away than Venus is, it can take several minutes for signals to get from Mars to the Earth from these rovers. And so in these cases, they could have already landed or crashed before we even start getting signals back from them. So it's just completely us in the dark until we get the signal and find out what happened. And that's part of why it's so scary um, and why you see so much celebration at the end when these missions are successful because there's a lot to it, a lot that's automated and we have no control over once it starts. Um, but it's also an amazing feat of technology and engineering that we're able to do this. So yeah, that's going to be exciting. Um, all right. Any questions, Eli? Um, so really quick, yeah. Um, so Ben Straka, who is my high school astronomy teacher and who helped me determine that this is what I wanted to do and go to schools for. So thank you, Mr. Straka. Um, asked uh, if anyone wants to make a prediction uh, as to the apparent magnitude of Comet Atlas. And I hope I remember this number correctly um, with the weird scale that magnitude goes by. But the human eyes limit is six, right? Yes. It is, yeah. And I know Comet Atlas is supposed to be um, kind of like moderately visible. So I don't know. I'd say it has to be at least there, Jessica, or anybody else. Do you guys know any better? Um, I oh, was, when I was doing the research um, and looking into it a little bit, and another cool thing that you can do with Stellarium, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, Mr. Straka knows this since he's probably well acquainted with all of it. Um, but for those of you that are listening that haven't used Stellarium a lot, um, if you're wondering about an object that was talked about in space at you know on space.com or um, uh, uh, or, or Astro Bob's um, blog, if you're wondering if that's something that you can just see, maybe you don't have a, a binoculars or telescope, but if that's something you want to know if you can see or not, Stellarium um, is full of data. Um, and um, you can click on any object. So you can click on the star Sirius and see what magnitude it is. You can click on the moon and it'll tell you what, you know, apparent magnitude it is and stuff like that. For those of you that, you know, would like to know if there are certain things that you can see without a telescope binocular, Stellarium, again, is a wonderful place to go. Um, or you can just call Jessica, um, she might know <laughs> as well, or Eli or Lindsay or I. Um, and I will say we are plotting, you know, um, as a future live stream of doing a kind of how to, how to use Stellarium so that you can figure these things out for yourself um, and give you these, these tools to help you out. So if that's something you're interested in, um, just check back in. Um, that'll probably be, we've got next week's schedule. So maybe we'll do it the week after. Yeah, um, but to get back to the question too, sorry, I was really beating around the bush there. Um, the apparent magnitude of, if I, I just looked on Stellarium. Um, it was during the April time. It'll be a five point something apparent magnitude. So it's going to be right on the verge of it. Though, depending on your location around May, it'll be near one or it'll be near zero. Oh, so wow. it, it's, yeah, but again, um, it's hard for me to tell 
how easy it's going to see it due to how close it is to the horizon. Depending on where you are, you just may not be able to see it at all, or maybe you have to go find an unused fire tower um, in the middle of a national park somewhere. Um, you didn't hear that from me. Um, but it, you may have to move locations to um, get a better vantage point at it. But it's supposedly supposed to be um, very near to, uh, to a, a, a apparent magnitude of one um, during um, the early May period before, for many of us here in Minnesota, it dips below the horizon. And just quick clarification for those that don't know, the magnitude scale goes in reverse. So the lower the number gets, the brighter it is. And one is one is pretty bright. That's that's quite something to see. Um, and like we said, just on the five point whatever mark is just barely visible, but still visible to the naked eye. Yeah. Cool. Well, maybe to your eyes, not to my eyes. <laughs> um. All right, well, who wants to go next? I can, can go next. Um, oh, oh, yeah, go ahead, whatever. Um, yeah, let's let Eli go. Uh, mine is pretty quick, um, but last, uh, well, the last show, which is on Wednesday, I kind of went for a um, uh, what happened in this day in space a long time ago. Um, and the one that caught my eye today was um, the Apollo 6 flight um so i'll see if i can't get this screen shared so you can see a picture of that um i think this should work did yep. that come up yep cool um so yeah this is the um one of the saturn uh rocket saturn 5 um that was launched this day in i believe it was 1968 um and this was the uh final uncrewed test flight of this rocket. Um, and it was deemed a successful mission. I do know um, there was a hiccup. Um, I believe some fuel line um, broke and or, or routed fuel somewhere that it wasn't supposed to go. So um, two rockets, I believe it was two rockets cut out early, but then um, two other ones went longer. So it kind of bounced out. Um, and because of that, it got pushed a little off trajectory. So it didn't go exactly where they thought it was going to go, but it was pretty close um, and uh, it was deemed successful. And uh, then it was approved um, for manned space missions. So that's pretty cool. Um, the Saturn V rocket is really amazing to look at. And this picture is even just kind of crazy. You can see the, uh, the um, fire tail coming off of it. It looks pretty gnarly. I always enjoy looking at that stuff. I want to try to get to uh, Canaveral to see a... Um, to see oh, a, they're uh, huge. I, just, I really want to see it. I always see the pictures of people that go there and they, they're um, in front of the thrusters at the mm -hmm. back one. And it's it's insane. I would really like to see that for myself. I, um, but, I have a picture. Um, I don't have it ready because I didn't think about that. Um, but I have exactly that picture. <laughs> that's super cool. I'm super jealous. Um, yeah, so there you go. This yeah. day in space, 1968. I will say it was a little bit easier for me to get to Florida when, you know, I lived in South Carolina. Right. As opposed to living in Minnesota, <laughs> getting to Florida. Right. Um, awesome. Yeah, I know we've been celebrating um, a lot of the Apollo stuff this past year since July 20th last year was the 50th anniversary of the first walk the first steps on the moon um, and we are thankfully finally working to get back there as um, Lindsay told us in our first show this afternoon uh, we have the Artemis mission that's going to be getting us back to the moon and then hopefully that's just the next stepping stone to then get us to Mars which would be amazing um, mm -hmm. all right well I want to go next because I'm excited to talk about my thing so there is, let me get it up, a new picture that came out on Wednesday of Erikoff, which is an object in the Kuiper Belt that is a kind of region of icy stuff out past uh, Neptune. And NASA released this picture on Wednesday um, and it may look a little funny to you. It may kind of look like a potato. Um, and that's because it actually, it, it, it is. This was one of NASA's April Fools um, for Wednesday. They tend to do a couple of really funny things. Um, but what's great about this 
is it really isn't that much of a stretch. Um, so here's an actual picture of Arakoth. Um, you can see it does kind of look like a potato. Um, I, if you've been to a show, know that I and some of the other planetarians there like to refer to asteroids and comets and things as lumpy space potatoes because that's what they look like. Um, and so this is what Arakov actually looks like. Um, it's a, um, as I said, Kuiper Belt object, so it's out past Neptune. And this was actually a really cool thing that we did. So you may know a few years ago, we had the New Horizons spacecraft that flew past Pluto and gave us our first ever up close look at Pluto, um, which is a whole other show I could probably talk for hours about. Um, I love Pluto. Anyway, um, after that successful flyby, um, the scientists working on the mission knew that they could then do something else. They could fly by another object that's out even further. And after searching, they set their sights on Arakoth. And so this flyby happened uh, January of last year and is the first Kuiper Belt object other than Pluto that we have ever seen up close and personal. And this one is kind of interesting. It seems to be kind of uh, two objects that are stuck together that are named Ultima and Thule. Um, and this is a really small guy. Um, we're talking, what was it, like 25 miles across, across the longest. Um, in comparison, Pluto is like two, 3,000 miles, I think. Um, it's, it's very, very, very small. Um, but this was just a really cool thing that happened. And another great kind of tag on to what was already a really successful mission with New Horizons. Um, and yeah, I just will take any chance I can to talk about New Horizons or Pluto or anything with that because it's my favorite and I love it. And that's one of the cool things about Ask and Astrocomer segments is we can talk about any interesting topic we want. And I like it. All right, Eli, do we have any questions? Uh, nothing right now, nope. All right, well, we've got a few more minutes. Um, and so does anyone else, Josh, did you have? Yeah, I just had something really quick. Um, okay, so go for it. Maybe... While we, um, people get your last questions um, in, um, we'll let Josh share his cool thing answer any of the last questions that come in, and then we will um, call it a day. So Josh. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, um, always something fun to talk about. Um, so I have two things I wanna share with all of you. First, I'm giving some ad space for um, Bob King. Um, he's got a vlog, which he, or I'm sorry, not a vlog, a blog, <laughs> um, which he populates with many, many articles. Um, all of them um, relevant for each day, um, does post quite often. Um, and I'm gonna wind back the clock a little bit. We're gonna go back to April 1st, which of course was April Fools, um, according to the Gregorian calendar. Um, and so on this day, um, which you can see here on the screen that I'm sharing is um, that someone um, from the Department of Physics of California, San Diego and Columbia University um, had um, written up a short paper um, on, unable be on, on their inability to detect the tooth fairy at optical wavelengths. So, um, you know, uh, whether it is um, the astronomers have succumbed to boredom um, during quarantine times or um, they um, really want to put in the effort to uh, share something that may lighten your heart a little bit. Um, this is a article, which is only three pages long. Um, the link is down here at the bottom. Um, it is a little verbose. So um, something that Bob suggests in his blog and something that I would also suggest for those of you that are looking into scholarly articles, 
Um, if you're looking to get at the gist of something, the abstract is a wonderful place to start. Um, and then um, if you're looking for some more details, you can jump to the conclusion. And then if you're still you know, hungry for more information, um, you can read the rest of the article. Um, but um, I think my favorite thing out of all of this um, was in the end, um, they had um, acknowledgments um, here at the end. And it says, this research was funded by Quarters Pilford from the snack machine up at the Kit Peak Visitor Center. Um, so there's there's a bunch of little goofy things in here. Um, some of them are maybe a little bit more geared towards adult humor, um, but it's, um, it, it's 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 a funny read if you're looking for. Something. I saw something else. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Okay. We admit it's <laughs> this one we made up. But I don't know about you. I've never seen the Tooth Fairy. So optical wavelengths, or am I just not looking in the right place? I mean, you don't know. Who knows? <laughs> Maybe you can read the article and figure out a little bit more. <laughs> so, and, and this is a kind of a fun thing too. Also something that Bob mentions in his article as well is that um, this is, this is, a, this is a major way how the science community, the Western science community communicates and it's via um, a written article and stuff like that. So if you just want to know kind of how things are done um, and for this one astronomy, um, this is the, this is kind of a layout. So maybe this is something that you want to do for your classes if you want to teach how you know how a scientific article is written. You know, here's something fun, lighthearted that you can introduce, um, and it's it's a uh, yeah, it's a good introduction. And there are some other good. Um, oh my God, the pictures. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there are some other good April Fools articles. It's kind of tradition every year. A couple come out. Um, another one that I saw this year that I really liked was someone, um, I don't think it was an article, I think it was a proposal to um, have telescope time at an observatory. So for people who don't know, um, you're not just guaranteed time on a telescope, you have to actually submit a proposal with um, kind of what your project would be, why it's significant, um, that sort of thing, and then a committee decides whose proposals are worth the time and give them time on the telescope. And so it's really competitive to get time on telescope. Um, and so someone for April Fool submitted a proposal that um, was something about, and I, I don't have it up in front of me, um, giving me telescope time will help in the droughts. Because apparently, whenever this person has had real telescope time, it has always rained. And so <laughs> that was his kind of joke proposal. And um, yes, it is as bad as it sounds. Uh, you are allotted a certain date and time to be on the telescope. And if it's cloudy or it rains, that, that's it. You're out of luck. Um, but that was, that was another good one that I saw. Um, I, I enjoy the scientific community is April Fools. Um, they have some really great ones. All right, well, Eli, any questions? Uh, nope, nothing no? comes through. All right, well, before we sign off, um, thank you guys for hanging out with us um, this afternoon in our mini virtual astronomy day while we lay in wait at home until it's safe to open up and do our for real big astronomy day. Um, information on that will be posted as soon as we are able to open up and set a date for that. Um, in the meantime, we will be continuing to do live streams on Wednesdays and Saturdays at 1. Uh, we have our topics for next week already out. So on Wednesday, we are going to tell you all about the phases of the moon and eclipses, um, since we know that that is some uh, part of school standards. And so a lot of students are kind of learning about that. Um, and we did get requests for that topic to be covered. And so we're going to tell you all about that, what causes it, and also give you a fun at-home demo that you can do that does a really good job of really showing why the phases of the moon happen. Um, and then on Saturday, we're going to tell you how you can be an astronomer from your home and take part in citizen science projects, um, which are real 
astronomical research projects that you can contribute to. And so we, we will tell you all about those um, Saturday next week. Um, so with that, um, I guess we're going to say goodbye, Facebook, for now. And we will see you again Wednesday at 1, same time, same place. So until then, bye, Facebook.